Okay, so I'm Brandon Gordon. I'm a staff technical marketing architect with VMR. Um, in this section, we're going to talk about uh, operationalizing your VMR Cloud and AWS environment with the vRealize cloud management. So uh, this is broken up into multiple parts. So we have uh, three different um, parts for this particular journey for VMware Cloud and AWS. So this is actually the first part of three. So I'll give you a little bit of background on what we're doing here. So I, we're, we're going to be doing a bit of role play here. So we're actually acting like we are this company, um, Moad.io. So we are portraying um, as Massachusetts Omni Automated Devices. Um, so in this particular scenario, we're a um, high-end robotics firm. We've been building a lot of industrial robots. Um, we're you know, doing uh, assistive tools for uh, people with disabilities. We have farm equipment. We have other AI projects coming go, going on. And back in 2019, we actually went through like a rebranding um, and launched this new commercial uh, environment where we're doing online sales, doing home robots and uh, robot kits, et cetera. So that's that's the um, the scenario we're painting here. So we have some business challenges that we're dealing with. So um, first ones are, you know, our sales are soaring, which is great, um, but that's causing an unexpected spike and increase in our CapEx. Um, you know, spend, um, spend. We've got uh, some outdated hardware. Um, we've got some lease coming due on our data centers. So, um, you know, we're basically getting into this crunch situation where, you know, we need to start addressing what's going on in the environment. Uh, we don't want to have to go and, you know, set up all new stuff. We want to um, have minimi minimize our training and our administrative effort, um, as well as uh, end user training as well. So with that, um, you know, we want to basically leverage VMware Cloud on AWS to handle these demands. Um, we're going to start evacuating out of um, our data centers and moving to a hybrid cloud model. And then we want to um, you know, basically tie in with, with our, our, you know, our hardware spend and refresh. Um, and then the last thing here is actually you know, leverage our Realize cloud management tools to meet our business challenges and ensure we have consistent operations across um, our hybrid cloud environment, so both on-prem and in the hybrid cloud. So with that, let me talk a little bit about who we are as a team. So uh, the first one here is Martijn. So he will be speaking in uh, a few minutes. Martijn represents our network and security team. So he, you know, his, basically his goal is to make sure that we have you know, the best network um, that we can. And you know, of course, it's uh, secure. Uh, then you have me, uh, Brandon, which I am Preparing the operations or VCR admin uh, in this situation. So you know, I want to make sure that you know, we're going to taking the most advantage of our hybrid cloud environment, make sure it's healthy, can run our applications, and we're meeting our performance um, needs. And then uh, we also have Vincent, which um, is on our automation team, so our cloud admin. So he's helping with our self-service portal and you know, provide the hybrid cloud to our internal users. So um, with that, uh, talk a little bit about what we're going to show here in this first uh, part. So this first session is our planning and migration phase. Uh, so we're going to cover things like um, assessing our capacity needs, understand what we will need in VMware Cloud and AWS. Um, then uh, our time will do some discovery of applications, um, actually do some migrations and show how uh, how that looks and how we can monitor and manage that um, as we're, we're doing the, the migration. So this will be between me and Martijn. Um, so with that, let me switch over and show you the demo. I am in VRLS operations. So the first phase is actually the planning piece. So I want to look at what it takes to start migrating to VMware Cloud and AWS. So the first piece is to understand you know, what we need. So I'm gonna go in here into planning. And in here, we have a lot of planning scenarios. So we have things like adding VMs, removing VMs, adding hosts, removing hosts. Um, we have data center comparison. And then the last one here is for our migration to the public cloud. So given the situation here, um, this is the one I'll select. I'll go to my what if analysis here and migration planning and migrate to VMC. And I will select my region. So we have all the, the regions listed here for the VMC, and I'll just select the Eastern uh, Virginia. And in here, I can enter the specs for what I want to migrate to the to the cloud. 
you know, th there's a lot of stuff here that we're actually going to be migrating. So entering them manually is not really um, you know, feasible. So I'm going to go in here and import existing virtual machines. So since we're looking at evacuating a data center, I'll go in the filters here and actually start looking at a particular data center. So go to my filter list here and find my data center. This one here is the SC2 DC01. This is the data center I want to migrate. I'll go in here and select all of my virtual machines. So this is selecting all 153 virtual machines in that data center. And now this comes back, we see I have all of it already pre-populated. So this is already looking at you know, what's allocated on the virtual machines, what they're consuming, you know, what they, basically what they need. Um, so this is all very simple. Um, I now know, you know all of my virtual machines, all my workload that I'm going to be going to migrate. So now when I run this scenario, I now can see what, what's being recommended. So some of the important stuff to look at here is uh, the recommendation here is for four hosts. So this is what I'll have to subscribe to to run the workload. Um, my projected utilization is 17% CPU, 46% memory, and 74% disk space. Um, so it kind of gives me an idea of you know, how I'll be consuming the servers. And then I have here my um, you know, estimated cost, but I can actually go in and change it. So like say, let's say, you know, maybe we're not ready to commit to a three-year plan. Let's just do pay-as-you-go for, you know, for a month or two and, and see how that looks. So I just select pay-as-you-go. And now I've got, uh, I got my cost here of, you know, projected about $24,000 a month for these four hosts. And then of course, you know, I can go in here and do some other things like entering discounts. You know, if, if we you know, end up negotiating a discount with VMware, you know, we can enter that discount. And then we have other things here, like look at our usage per hosts. But the other part I want to um, point out here is- um, uh, but before, is before you move on from that, I, ha I have so many questions. Um, and and if, if, the, if, if these questions are like spoken to later on, please just you know let, let me know and we can table them. Um, the so so we're running this out of VROP. So obviously we're grabbing real time information from vCenter. We're we're getting the sizing, and, and we're also looking at the recommendations of of how VROP would, would would resize something. Can can you also incorporate in your resize recommendations into the migration planning and uh, Additionally, on top of that, um, <laughs> the the public cloud migrations. Can you? Does it? Will it pick the commensurately sized EC2 instance or or Azure VM for for the type, or will it guesstimate high or guesstimate low, or will it also do that resize? Thank you. <laughs> yep, sure. So um, for basically doing the right sizing and um, this migration analysis, it's not done both together at the same in the same workflow. So you can look at you know, right sizing, like if I wanna go and right size all of my virtual machines, you can do that kind of analysis. And then you can also do, you know, what if I move all of my virtual machines to VMware Cloud and AWS? It's not actually, you know, if I do migrate all the virtual machines and right size them at the same time, that, that's the piece that's not in there. So gotcha. it's looking okay. at what, the, what they're consuming now and using that. Okay. So, does that help? If you wanted to do a migration, but you didn't want to do a wholehearted migration to VMware Cloud, is there any kind of integration with application knowledge? So you'd be able to go, look, we've detected a SQL database here. You could move this to yes. this platform rather than move the VM. Yeah, and actually, Martin will be showing how that part works um, in a few minutes. So we'll we'll cover that part. Uh, but yeah, you can select you know, any virtual machines that you want to target. And it can be, you can do it like an application by application basis um, if you want to go that approach. Yeah, that's, that's doable. And then, and then your other question about um, sizing for the e AWS or EC2 instances, I'll cover that in um, the the last session uh, that we're doing today. So uh, hold on to that question. Uh, you'll you'll get an answer to that soon. So uh, to keep on going here, um, we see have a few other options that we can configure. So this is like reserving amount of CPU and memory. So if we want to you know, have some buffer in there for um, for CPU uh, memory resources, we can also go and configure things like I want to do. Let's say I want to do fault tolerance uh, of two and RAID levels of six. You know, maybe I just you know, really, really want extra protection. I can go in here and now the system goes and redoes the calculations and says, now I need eight hosts based on these RAID config. You know, maybe it's not the best thing to, to select here, but to give you an idea, you know, this is what we would need if we wanted to go with that, that RAID configuration. So this, the, the idea here is now we have a, you know, an understanding of how many hosts we need to start doing our migration um, from our data center. So you know, based on the defaults, we, we would subscribe to four hosts and then start doing our migration um, on those four hosts. Cool, thanks, uh, Brandon. All right, um, so that was an example of planning for an entire data center evacuation. 
but there's a lot of ways that you can do those migrations, right? I mean, you can do it per uh, per application, per entire data center, per network. Um, the one that we see most often coming by is the one per application, where they can more easily find uh, the uh, the actual performance of the application and make sure that it do doesn't go to hell. If, uh, sorry, if if you go to uh, to the to the cloud. So to get those applications in place, we need to find out what those applications are at the first place. So Virialize Network Insight comes in when with its application constructs and then also the uh, the application discovery that we've got. Um, just as a level set, an application within VNI is just is just an, an, an application name, uh, a bit of tiers, and then the members of it. Could be a VM, could be uh, a, a physical server, could also be a public cloud instance, uh, the workload behind it, basically. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you how we do those disc application discoveries from that environment. Um, we can do that by a couple of ways. We can use metadata that's available within the configuration of this environment. So if you've got tags that uh, include the application name and the tier name, uh, if you have an up-to-date CMDB within ServiceNow, which not a lot of people have, but if you do, then you can grab from there. There's also a naming convention, and then there's a way to uh, combine all of these together. So if you if you have the uh, the application name in uh, the VM name, and then the tier might be a tag, you can combine them with the advanced tag. I'm going to focus on the uh, the application, um, the flow-based application discovery, because that's pretty much the easiest way because you don't have to have anything in place. Flow-based application discovery, the name pretty much says it. It looks at the network traffic going on through the network and then does some machine learning over it to, um, to group workloads together uh, based on the communication that they're having and then even goes further into application groups and define tiers by looking at the, uh, the similar uh, network communication that they might have had. So, if you've got multiple web servers, uh, it will communicate over port 80. So all the port 80 VMs will basically be uh, be grouped together. And then you get this list. Um, for example, if I um, expand this one, uh, we can see we've got a database VM and an application VM, one database, two, uh, two application VMs. And then I can just hit all of these and just save them to the system. And then we can start using them. Um, when we can actually start using them, that's where it becomes a little bit more interesting. And it can go away. Because if I look at, for example, that MOAD application that we've been talking about, uh, we need to evacuate that. So we need to know how that MOAD application is behaving. So we just look for uh, the, uh, the production shopping uh, cart that opens up a application dashboard where we can see First of all, uh, a lot of information around the networking behavior of this application. So the, in, the the traffic details, what is incoming, what is outgoing, which flows, even which um, uh, countries are accessing this internet, uh, this internet-facing uh, application, and also the uh, the changes in the last 24 hours. So it's it's easy if you like have an application that's misbehaving and you see a massive spike within that last 24 hours, then you might have an idea of, of what's going on. Um, but more interestingly is this, uh, this topology that we can see based on the network traffic that goes on within this app. So you've got the uh, the database tier. You can see it's in a vCenter environment. Uh, it's also got some problems that Freenize nice detected. Uh, the web application tier, you can see that this one is talking to uh, the internet also and some shared uh, physical and virtual uh, uh, servers and also some other applications. But I could drill down into all of these individual communications and see what's going on when it comes to the network flow. I'll, I'll do that in a little bit. Um, on this same application dashboard, you have like, where is it hosted? Which vCenter is, uh, is it hosted on? Are there any changes, uh, any alerts within this application? So if, if there's uh, a firewall rule changes, for example. You can also use this uh, this dashboard for a little bit more metrics. So if, if you want to dive into one of these uh, these VMs, it, it, it might be uh, misbehaving when it comes to networking spikes or something like that. If I mean, if this network traffic doesn't look um, uh, 
look right, then you can dive in a little bit more deeper, but this is just a quick check of all of the VMs and then all the, um, the traffic that goes through it. And finally, what I want to show you on this dashboard is the micro part, or I should actually say security planner part because micro is where we started. But we see a lot of customers doing a lot of different things with this security planner because we can group uh, by a lot of different objects such as the application itself or just a tier or uh, per VM, of course, also. But if you group by tier, you just get the, the, the tier communication between different tiers. And if I open up one of these slices, the database tier, for example, then I get one, all the information about the services that are hosted within this group. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. This is gonna be a MySQL uh, uh, service, uh, this flow. You can see the uh, the external accesses, uh, also the raw flows, but more interesting, we've got this recommended file rules here, where you can see based on the traffic that Fear and I is seeing, it, it'll suggest the, these file rules for you. You can export this, um, this list, either as a CSV or XML. And this XML is gonna get interesting because then you can take that XML and actually import it into something. Uh, same thing for the CSV, but we've got some uh, some existing scripts for the XML ones. For example, if you're migrating this stuff, this application, then you might export uh, this uh, these rules and then import them into the VMware Cloud and AWS NXST environment, for example. So this, this is one app. Um, so if we're doing a per application migration, which most of the, uh, the customers that I talk to uh, are, are doing like that, uh, then you might want to look into what is, how is this application behaving? <clears throat> you can find all of that within that application dashboard, but you can get a lot more around for your and I. And I've just grabbed a, uh, built a pin board here, which with the most important information. Um, so I, I, I want to know how much traffic goes through this application. What of this traffic is north, south, so internet facing, incoming, outgoing, so I can kind of make an estimation of the egress uh, costs there. What is east west? So how much traffic do I need to take into account that will flow from this application back towards on-prem if I migrated? And also the maximum traffic rate. So I need to have at least a uh, 100 uh, megabit pipe if, if I want to make, migrate this, uh, this app. So Martin, if I, if I can yep. interrupt uh, for a moment, sure. because I'm kind of curious where these numbers come from because I mean, if this is migration planning, odds are the environment you have is, you know, older, doesn't have, you know, networking products like NSX. So how do you gather all that data in different kind of source environments? What are the requirements for that? Yeah, and that's a very good one because it's pretty various. Um, VRNI supports a lot of data sources, as we call them. Uh, NSX vSphere is of course one of them, but we also look into the uh, the physical hardware, um, the uh, the public cloud, all of that. Uh, but these actual numbers, where you uh, which you're looking at right now, basically all of this, because the security planner also feeds on the uh, on the flows, that comes from uh, NetFlow or SFlow, and that can come from a lot of different uh, sources. So. Uh, the uh, the vSphere distributed switch has it built in, uh, NSX, of course. And if you don't have any of those, you can go to the top of rack switch. Um, I'm willing to bet that 99.99% of all the enterprise switches support either NetFlow or SFlow. Um, so there's a lot of different ways we can get this information. Our preferred way is the, uh, the vSphere distributed switch, because then you can actually get the uh, the actual flows directly from the the virtual NIC within the uh, the VM. Um, otherwise, you might miss in inter host traffic. Um, so the VDS is preferred, uh, but it, it's it's not the only uh, thing. So do you also support? Um, I don't want to necessarily say non VMware workloads, but do you also support things like containers or cloud native stuff, like you know VMs running in EC2 or something like that? Yep, yep. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll actually show a demo um, in the public cloud session around the AWS support. Uh, but what we do with AWS is, is, is pull the, uh, the flow logs. So it, we have the exact same information coming from AWS, Azure, uh, but also container uh, environments, uh, which are running NSXT. 
Um, so then the information comes from NSXT. Um, we also have customers using it for, uh, for um, um, uh, Hyper-V uh, environments. When they're looking at the Hyper-V generated flows, um, it'll just appear as it, it's like a physical um, flow within Vue and I because we don't support Hyper-V out of the box, but we still can ingest all of those flows because that's a um, an industry standard. So wh wherever it's coming from, uh, Vue and I can ingest it and then correlate it back to these these types of pin boards. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, can you take the data that you're collecting in VRNI and uh, somehow share that with VROPS? Because I, I noticed that you pointed out the estimated uh, uh, egress traffic that you've got in this dashboard right here. Can you have VROPS factor that into the cost of migrating to the cloud? Uh, so yes and no. <laughs> uh, basically, you can export anything that you'd like from VRNI. That's one. Uh, we do have a native integration with VRI's operations when it comes to uh, events uh, and applications, which we'll also show in in, uh, in a further off demo. Uh, but the, um, the 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 number of um, egress traffic is not taken into account with the um, the the the, the VROPS planning phase yet, but it, it is something that we're looking at. Where we're going with this and what we've been talking about, are we saying that we require vSphere on both sides, on-prem, public, all these different moving parts, or are we saying that we can move, say, an on-prem on vSphere environment to a native AWS construct, SDDCs and all those things? or is the vSphere component required on the v, uh, AWS side as well? Uh, or is that something uh, you're gonna get to later on when we start talking about the other pieces of um, like Azure and things like that as well? Yeah, it, it kind of looks like you've uh, taken a sne sneak peek in uh, in our internal agenda because that's exactly one we want to demo. Um, okay, I haven't seen anything. I'm just asking a question. So good, thank you. I'll be quiet. Uh, yeah, so that, that that that's coming up. Um, so it, we definitely want to cover it because okay. well, okay. we we are pretty agnostic when it comes to okay, which good. type of workloads you want to okay. monitor and, and manage with that. So awesome. I know that there's um. There's a cloud version of VRNI. How can that work for these type of scenarios on premises with some form of cloud connector or something like that, or is that used for different cloud native uh, workloads? Yep, yep. Um, to be very straightforward, VRNI on prem and VRNI cloud is exactly the same. It's it's a little bit different color scheme, but all the feature features and functionalities are exactly the same. Um, it actually started as a SaaS product at first, and then they pulled it on-prem. Um, and basically what you just do is you put it a collector on-prem because it does need to access some of the management uh, components within your secured network. So you, you want to have that on-prem and then that collector will report back up onto the, uh, the VRNI cloud instance. Let's, let's go for a quick scenario. Um, there's a customer who has a VMware environment. Um, not very familiar with VRNI, right? And they want to do migration to VMC, for example. Uh, they've got a thousand machines on their environment. First of all, what are they going to deploy to get all this information? Because it's useful to you know, um, assess um, egress traffic costs that, and link speed and all of this kind of thing that you're just showing on the screen. Um, so that would be one goal met. But what would be the other costs, for example, you know, uh, in terms of appliances to be deployed on premises, do they have to keep deploying or keep it there? Or what would be the minimum amount of time that they need to keep them there? Um, so, so what would be the process of doing that? Yeah. Um, we have assessments, as we call them, um, like a virtual network assessment, SD-WAN assessment, and uh, the migration assessment, which is pretty much what you're describing there, the migration assessment. So what we do is we spin up a VRNI cloud instance that doesn't cost any resource, of course, because we host it. And then the, all the customer has to do is deploy the uh, the VRNI collector on-prem. Um, so that can be, de depending on the size of their environment, that can be a, um, a, a small uh, collector. I mean, uh, uh, on the top of my head, that's like 12 gigabytes of RAM, that's it. Uh, the bigger ones goes up to uh, 32. Um, and then we just need to add the data sources. If there's an existing vSphere environment, just add the vCenter 
and you're basically done for uh, migration planning because everything that flows through vCenter, if that's the, the source environment that you want to migrate, then just focus on that. And anything that's communicating outside of outside of that feature environment will also be taken into account because it, it the traffic will flow through the uh, the feature with the distribute switch. Um, so yeah, you will you will see that. So depending on the size of the environment, it might just be one collector that you need to deploy. So you one last thing uh, also uh, revolving the migration when it comes to this pinboard is the uh, the uh, the context that we offer in a geographical form. So we know where internet traffic is coming from, and then you, and we use IP database lookups in order to determine what country they're coming from or what continent they're coming from. And then I can pull out this this um, this overview where, where I can easily see which countries are using the most bandwidth towards this application. So you can use this in order to plan out well, like in which part of the world should I uh, move this application. So if if you do have a VM cloud and AWS SDC in London, for example, then it might make more sense to put this app in London because, well, the, the UK is the most uh, used in here. Uh, yeah, let me move on to that second part because this, all of this is planning stuff. So you know what to expect when you're picking up this, this application and then migrating it somewhere. You know what kind of network requirements you have to do, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but now let's, let's look at how that actually happens with um, some of our customers. So first off, um, we're looking at all of the applications that VR9 discovers, that just the entire application landscape, it, it puts that in these application constructs, and then we can use them and actually put them into VMware ACX. I am not going to cover ACX entirely. There are uh, better persons to do that, uh, but I'm going to cover how we get from VR9 application discovery towards ACX, and that's we got some existing scripts uh, to do that. Um, and I'm actually going to just run this and see what happens. Hopefully it still works. Uh, but what this basically does, it, it, it syncs from VRNI all the application constructs that are in there, uh, syncs them towards HCX as mobility groups. Um, and just as sake of time, I, I'm, I'm limiting this, uh, this to five applications, but you can see that we've got the couple of three tier apps with some, some VMs. Uh, and then it goes on to uh, connect to ACX. And this has to work, please. Yay. And then it goes on to create those, those uh, mobility groups. So basically what happens now is that you've got a mobility group within ACX, which will list those VMs that are a part of that application that uh, Fear and I has discovered because they're talking to each other and they're, um, uh, well, they're, part of the same app. And now you can do either per application. So this is a per application uh, uh, migration wave. And then you can go in and, and change all of the, the settings to specify the, uh, the destination, the type of migration. So whether you want to do a, um, a replication or a vMotion or those type of things. And then you just hit go and it, it starts to migrate that. Um, and again, I'm not the right person to uh, to comment that much on ACX, but just as a quick understanding on how you get from all of those, that application discovery towards ACX, um, so you don't have to type that over manually, which is kind of a good thing. You don't want to do anything manually. When it comes to migration, because if you make a mistake, then and you leave a VM behind, then <laughs> bad things are going to happen. <clears throat> Hope that answers your uh, your question, Arthur. It does. Good to see. Excellent. Yes. That script that you saw is a fling, by the way. We um, we put that out. Um, so that's already there and available. Um, so now I'm still the networking admin, so I'm I'm, I'm handing over the um, the migration towards the, uh, the the VI admin or maybe Brandon or someone else that's dedicated for uh, for migrations. But I do want to keep an eye out on the networking behavior of that VMware Cloud and AWS environment in this case. So I, again, I put together a pin board of all kinds of different information that we can grab from, um, from the, uh, the environment, both on-prem and VMC in order to make sure that we, we know what's going on. Um, 
so for example, we can look at all the traffic uh, in and out of the VMC SDDC. So this is going over the data center into interconnect pretty much. Uh, you can keep an eye out that there's no too heavy spikes and, and all of that. Um, and we just have one SDDC. Um, so that's, then there's one, just one, um, one list. But if you've got multiple SDDCs, it will come together also. We're gonna also, what, can I, what I can also do is look at the, the network traffic that goes over the ACX layer two extended networks. Um, if you're not a networking uh, a person, then this might not make too much sense. But in the, um, in the basis, ACX offers L2 extension in order not to have to re-IP your VMs. Um, so it basically just overlays a, a tunnel between on-prem and VMC and make sure that you can use IPs on both sides, the same IPs. Uh, but there are certain limits to that because you're using the ACX appliances to forward that traffic. Um, and those, those appliances, have, like any type of software, have some limit there. So you want to keep an eye on a per network basis, like how many, how much traffic is one extended network um, uh, pushing. So there's a couple of extended networks as you can see here, and then you can just make sure that they're not going over that that limit. Um, but I also don't want to do that like manually, right? I mean, I don't, I don't want to go to this dashboard every time just to see if there's a problem or not. I want to I want to be alerted when something bad happens. And for that, we can create an analytics threshold, um, what we call an analytics threshold. And this is pretty much a um, sort of an analytics um, backend processing where you can say, I don't want to go over this amount of traffic for this specific part of my environment. And I'm being extremely vague there because this bit can be a lot of different things. I'm currently focused on the, um, the ACX appliances. So these are the network extension appliances, but it can be regular VMs. It could be a combination of VMs. It could be the AWS Direct Connect. Um, those objects are, are very, very variable. Um, but basically what I've done here, I've, I've, I've set a limit of 50 max. And every time that this traffic, this extension, these appliances go over that 50 max, then I get an alert. So there's an open threshold, uh, analytics threshold event right now. And I can get that via email or an SNP trap in order to get alerted when that traffic goes over that threshold. And as you can see, it's just one mag over in this case. Um, <clears throat> but this, this allows me to get notified whenever that network extensions gets utilized too heavy. That's, uh, that's where I'm heading there. All right, back to the pin board where I also want to keep an eye out on the average latency between on-prem and the uh, the VMC environment, for example. So I've got this um, um, this table where you can see the average latency from one data center to the uh, VMC on um, yeah the the VMC SDDC. Um, you can see we've got a couple of these data centers in here, so I can look at the at the, the average latency for each and every single one of these because they will have different connections coming from the data center towards the, um, the SDDCs. And again, if I wanna get an alert when this spikes too heavily, then I can set an analytics threshold and get that email or SMB trap. If I'm troubleshooting something, then I can dive a lot deeper into uh, all the network traffic that goes over those extended network flows. So I can look on a per flow base. Um, in this case, between the ACX web server and an ACX database server over port 80, you can see there's a lot of, um, well, not a lot of traffic, but for our test environment, there's a lot of traffic. And here comes also a little bit more um, context where you can easily see what is this flow about. I mean, just source and destination IP address and ports doesn't really make sense anymore because you have to look what what is behind that IP, what is behind that port, et cetera. So Veer and I tries to add as much as uh, context as possible. So for example, we've got the, the source VM, data uh, destination VM, but also security groups. So if there's an NSX environment or if it's a AWS environment, then um, um, you, you, you will see the, those security groups pop up and you can have a look at the, uh, the configuration of that and what traffic does it allow, et cetera. 
and all kinds of different things around the um, the the, the V center where it's hosted, like resource pool, fluke, uh, folder, cluster, etc. So just to make you aware of like where is this this flow coming from, in, instead of just saying, "Hey, this is it." Um, You're not advocating that the best practice would be to extend L2 across. Right, you're just saying you're just going through. I see you grinning because I know you know where I'm going with this. Um, I just want to be number one. You're not advocating saying, "Hey, yes, do this as a best practice." You're saying that capability is here if you so choose to do such. Right? Yes. However, um, so I'm 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 a true networking guy from yes. where I used to be in the, in the NARC and all, all of that. So I I absolutely loathe L2 extensions just wanted yeah. to make that effect. Um, but with every single migration that we've seen so far, it's way too big of a hassle for the, um, the, um, the customers to re-IP. Yeah. And there are a lot of cases where they cannot migrate everything in the, in the same network at once. Um, right. that, so they typically do it on a per application basis, which kind of makes it an evil like requirement to have these things. Yeah. Um, that's exactly why we kind of doubled down on migration, uh, monitoring these uh, these auto extensions because they're being used so heavily. But as you probably know, which is why you're asking the question, these things can make your network quite complicated and also uh, quite fragile. Um, but yeah, al although ACX has done uh, like a pretty good job of like local egress and you can do local um, routing and and all of that, but it still it it irks me still my 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 neck hair still goes up whenever I have to do these light L two yeah. extensions. But yeah. but the but the monitor. intent is a migration, right? It's not long living like L two communication between two different sites yeah. or all that. So okay, of course you thank you. Yeah, it's just that the average migration cycle of uh, um, uh, a big customer is Never not ends. like days; it's more <laughs> like months. So. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Why. Thank you. So with the, if, if someone that's not so aligned to networking side of things, would you use the layer two extension as a temporary measure to enable the migration with then a plan to put it on a further subnet further down the line? Would that be a typical use case that you would support using that you'd recommend was used for? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Typically it's, it's, it's um, uh, a temporary like patch. So you don't have to um, uh, to change anything on the VMs that that you're migrating, uh, but you can use it for if you are migrating them and then reappearing them later, for example. Um, so if you want to get out of your data center like in a hurry and you might want to reappear later, then that that could also work. But typically, it's 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 a temporary um, fix that you could you have to do, yeah. I've actually already showed you these one, uh, this one in the um, the, um, the analytics threshold with the with the spike and all. Uh, but I just wanted to show you that whenever Vera and I just de detect something, then it, it'll put that on the on the timeline as well. Um, and you can have a look at what type of alerts are um, activated on that point in time. And in this case is going to be that uh, that threshold. <clears throat> okay, and. If I'm not running the migration and I still want to keep tabs on what is migrated and what is not migrated, then I can also have a look at what the VMs and what the applications are um, that are being migrated that way. <clears throat> 